Jeff was telling me that the broccoli's starting to turn. I guess they have some down there. Is it in the freezer or refrigerator? It's all freezer. in the freezer. No, so it's, it's a cooler. It's a cooler. That's not a freezer. It's okay, so it's not quite cold enough. Okay. That's a walk-in cooler. Okay. We need to Actually, it's starting to turn in our freezers, too. Yeah, we, we need to get that one rolling for us. Gotcha. All right, so... Sorry, I'm just looking at something real quick here. Um... Cody's on with us. Hi, Cody. So just a, a couple announcements to share while we're waiting for everybody to get on with us. Um, pantry is going to be October 22nd. Um, thank you to everybody who was able to come to the prayer crawl last night. Uh, we have our Salem County Men for, Quite, Men for Christ and Women for Christ are having their breakfasts on Saturday the 15th. Uh, the men are at 8 a.m., the women are at 10 a.m. And the women are having their gala event. It's a special event. So we have a flyer for that. Hi, Jane. Jane's on with us, too. Um, the 15th is also going to be a Sam's dinner, our senior adult ministries dinner. Um, so a lot like the fish fry, this one's going to be hosted by Port Elizabeth. They don't have lots of details right now. We're trying to figure that all out. I don't know what the menu is yet, but it's the same plan as last time where... I think it's a cover. It's a potluck. I think it's co it said co bring cover dish or dessert, It said it? bring dessert. Oh. I think the plan is for each church to provide the main meal and to just invite people to bring desserts. Oh, gotcha. Um, but we don't have all the details on the menu yet. So um, just mark your calendar. We've got momentum coming up the 29th. That's the discipleship training. Um, everybody that had asked to be signed up was. We can still sign people up. It's just a few dollars more. So if you didn't get a chance to sign up and are still interested, we still have um, a little bit more time to add people. So I think we're up to eight people going right now. So if you want to go, you won't be going alone. And then we have our zone revival services, um, October 30th through November 2nd. And as part of the preparation for revival, we're going to be taking a little bit of time in tonight's gathering to pray <coughs> for, for revival. We're going to do that at, at 7.30. We're going to try to jump on Zoom with some other churches. So for our friends on Facebook, you should definitely be able to hear. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see. So um, we've got some prayer requests coming in. Jane has asked for prayers for a classmate who was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and has now been put on hospice. Mm -hmm. like to keep asking for prayers for um, a friend Janine who is, was diagnosed with breast cancer. <coughs> she's uh, dealing with treatment. She's having some side effects. But uh, you know, all told, doing well so far. Um, for our church, please pray for um, Barbara and her family, her sister Deborah, passed away. So 
So please especially pray for Deborah's son, Jamie. Um, he had to run back home to Chicago for just a little bit, but um, we're going to be planning a service as soon as possible, and uh, we'll let everybody know. Um, but yeah, of course not just Jamie, but Barbara and Kelly have been caring for Deborah for quite a while. So this is a hard, a hard transition. But Deborah had been very sick and was also quite strong in her faith, and so we're thankful that we're thankful that she's not suffering anymore. Yeah. 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 Um, as far as um, the hurricane stuff goes, we need to pray for lots of people in lots of different places. My Aunt Myrtle's okay. Janet spoke to her. Uh, I saw Janet yesterday, and Aunt Myrtle's good. All right. Yeah. It's going to take a lot more than hurricane to get her down. Mm -hmm. Hi, Trudy. Uh, my mom's friend, Maria, and her, her friend, Nola. Sarah and Charlene. Yeah. What? Sarah and Charlene said hello, too. I don't see that. I see Trudy. Oh, really? Hi, Daryl and Charlene. Oh, it just popped up. All right, Trudy and Daryl and Charlene are on with us. <clears throat> um, yeah, so they were in Tampa. So there was flooding, but they were in a second floor apartment. Maria was in a second story of an apartment building. And so they had some flooding in the first floor, but they actually didn't lose power. Oh, she said it's just Charlene. Oh, that's sad. No, Hunter? Hunter, bark if you can hear me. <laughs> when I say his name when we're on Zoom meetings, he gets excited. So oh, that's I hope that by saying Hunter <laughs> repeatedly, he's jumping around and barking in her living room. But, um, yeah, so thank God for that, but I'm sure you've seen a lot of the pictures. Right. Um, there are a lot of people in a lot of places who are hurting right now. Yeah. There's been some criticism that some of the touristy areas are getting a lot more attention than some of the residential areas. I think that's something we understand. That's something that Puerto Rico is very much struggling with still. Um, and remember, they got hit a couple weeks before. Mm -hmm. So, what? Just a couple days. I thought it was like a week. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was a week, but it wasn't a couple weeks. It's no, a couple weeks from now. Like yeah. Four yeah. Well. Let's pray for, I guess what I'm saying is we're talking about two different hurricanes here. So right. Pray for victims of both. Oh, Hunter is there, but he doesn't hear me. Oh, so sad. I wanted to tell Hunter about Gog and Magog. <laughs> so please pray for hurricane victims. Um, what else? Let's see. Marvin Poole and his wife, let's keep them in our prayers. I'm not supposed to tell things like this, but I'm gonna anyway. Um, you guys probably know that Marvin made the cross out in the foyer, I mentioned that. He made me a walking stick. Oh, cool. Yeah, he had a tree that went down in his yard, a mulberry tree. So he harvested all the wood he could from it. Hmm. So he uh, gave me a walking stick from it. That's very nice. need a walking stick? I'm getting there. <laughs> getting there. <laughs> so. I donated my walker that they gave me to a patient. So I, I kept my, my cane, my left my cane. Yeah. Uh, so Marvin Poole, we talked about Aunt Myrtle. Um, as far as I know, um, Kay wants us to keep praying for her friend Patty. Yeah. So until she says no, we're going to keep praying. Patty has some chronic back issues that cause her severe pain. Well, Janet's doing good. Williams? Mm -hmm. Amen. So uh, the last update I had, she had the pins removed, cast off, and then started physical therapy. Yep. And you're saying physical therapy's going okay? Yep. Amen. That's not easy at any age. Mm -mm. 
but especially with some of her arthritis and other injuries. So let's keep Janet in our prayers. Um, we need to keep Venus's family in our, in our prayers, especially her cousin Chris and his wife Betsy. Remember, they lost their daughter and a brother and a nephew all within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And um, Chris is still waiting for another surgery. They have postponed it because of the funeral arrangements for Melissa. Mm -hmm. um, we found out that their nephew who got killed it was one of the people who got killed in Wildwood where they were racing the cars after that show. And Ralphie was down there. Yeah, my uncle was down there too, but luckily he was not on the road when that happened. No. Ralphie was helping out the police officer stop traffic. Wow. And our daughter lives down there. Yeah. Well, I mean, thankfully it wasn't worse than it was, but that's something to pray about. Those situations yeah. get out of hand real fast. Yeah. Um, um, the Jane, Jane posted about her friend, but let's keep praying for uh, Danny and Dylan and Gina and Anna, because let's always pray for kids and grandkids. You don't want to run this. <laughs> <laughs> and all the others. Nineteen grandchildren. Nineteen. Wow. That's uh you can almost have two football teams. <laughs> ten great grandchildren. Yeah, ten great grands. And cheerleaders. <laughs> well there you go. Anything else uh, on the prayer list? Uh, I think Jill's gonna do our, our NMI prayer tonight, right? It's from Honduras, so Joe can say all the words that I can't say. <laughs> okay. The stool might be too high for you, sorry. It probably is. It's okay. You can just scroll up if, it, if it's not quite all on there. No, I'm, it's no. on there. No, like it keeps going down from Oh, I there. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so tonight we're talking about Honduras. Honduras is a Central American country with a population of approximately 9.9 .9 million people. The official language is Spanish. The Church of the Nazarene began work in Honduras in 1970. Uh, Danilo Solis was sent to the city of San Pedro de Sula by Reverend James Hudson to plant the first Nazarene church. Global Missions then sent uh, missionary Reverend Stanley Story to direct the work of the mission in Honduras in 1973. <coughs> the church continues to grow in, and to thrive in Honduras today through the work of faithful, faithful pastors and leaders. There are 8,709 members, 140 fully organized churches, and six not yet fully organized churches. There are 56 district licensed and 26 ordained minister, ministers on two districts. They would like us to pray for the migrants who are entering Honduras. Every day, 500 people, including families with youth and children, are arriving from Venezuela, Cuba, Haiti, and other countries. Pray for the establishment of the Church of the Nazarene in the Department of La Mosquitia and in the uh, central southeast um, district of the country. It is a community that can only be reached by water or air. Pray that the Holy Spirit continues to guide every Nazarene pastor in the country and pray for the continual growth of the church so that the missions can become organized churches. Uh, the praises are we praise God for the medical brigade ministry that was started two years ago on the Central Southeast District. We praise God that the Northwest District is continu continuing to move forward Despite the pandemic, we thank God for always providing for the needs of the families and churches, and we praise God for the ways that the districts are continu continuing to grow and develop. I'm having the word con trouble with the word continuing tonight. <laughs> it's a tough one. I believe in you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Nazarene's minister to children and adolescents in vulnerable communities in Honduras. An and an 
evangelism event that took place in La Lima, Honduras, brought together more than 200 children and youth from three communities where the Church of the Nazarene has active discipleship programs. The event was held by a team of pastors and discipleship teachers. During the event, the, participate, the participants enjoyed a time of prayer, songs, and a Christ-centered message. 34 of the participants decided to give their lives to Jesus during this time. The children and youth who participated are a part of discipleship groups in these churches, Bethel de la Lima, Colonia Martinez, and Colonia Pineda Number 2. Hmm? Numero dos. Um, Sorry, I just I didn't understand that part. Gerson <laughs> Martinez, a collaborator in the event and district leader, said that the Martinez and Pineda, it literally says number two, neighborhoods are at the ends of the city and have many needs. These communities suffer from problems such as the recruitment of minors for gangs, malnutrition, lack of medical care, family disintegration, schools de school desertion due to lack of economic resources, and child exploitation. In Pineda number two, community leaders lent the church land to set up a temporary site which will serve as a meeting place for them to continue ministering to the children and adolescents with whom they currently meet weekly. In addition, the leadership is preparing to minister to parents and more members of the community there. The mission is to establish a church that we can that can serve the spiritual and social needs of that community state of Martinez. We hope to build links that will allow us to carry out the plans we have for that community. Um, would you be okay if you start the prayer for Honduras and then I'll do the other prayer request? Absolutely. All right. Any <laughs> any other requests before we go to prayer? The chicken. Sure. Let's just say meat. You want to pray for chicken? Um, Protein. The pray for meat. poultry farm that normally donates chickens to the pantry had an outbreak of the avian flu that's been going around, mm -hmm. and so they had to call some of their chickens. So it looks like they probably won't be able to donate chickens to us this month. And so with the avian flu and, of course, Thanksgiving coming up, mm. it's going to be harder to get poultry donations. And it's going to be more expensive. Right. Yeah. And generally, because, I mean, there aren't any giant beef ranches in Delaware, so we generally, poultry is, is what gets donated to us. So we're just praying that we get another source of protein for Pantry Day. Mm -hmm. Did I say that right? Yes. So it could be hams, it could be cows, beef, beef, Taxi burger. probably not oxtail because that didn't go over that well. <laughs> but not yeah. oxtail. We did get some soup bones. Okay. Yeah. So I'll pray for Honduras and then you will yeah. take on. Oh, okay. Really All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this time that we have here together to uh, come to you in prayer and also to fellowship with one another. I thank you for the word that we received uh, about Honduras and for the ministries that are occurring there. I thank you for the growth of the Church of the Nazarene that um, has happened there uh, over the past <coughs> 50 or so years, Lord. And I just thank you so much that, they've blessed, that you have blessed them as a district. I pray for um, the needs that they mentioned um, regarding the migrants who are entering from there. I pray that there will be a uh, way for them to handle um, this huge um, influx of people. I pray that there are places for them to go and um, resources for uh, the people of Honduras to be able to help them. I also pray um, for the other areas of the country um, that are difficult to reach, uh, particularly this community um, that was mentioned that uh, can only be reached by water and air. And I just pray that you will make a way for the Church of the Nazarene to continue to minister to them and um, provide missionaries so that they can uh, learn about you and um, grow a church there. Um, and I just pray uh, for the Nazarene pastors in Honduras um, that you will continue to bless their churches. I pray that um, they will uh, continue to have growing missions in the country um, and 
Uh, Lord, I pray that you will just continue to flourish that church, Father. Father, while we're praying for the world, we want to pray for all those who are suffering <coughs> under the effects of the, uh, the hurricanes that have come through recently. We think of um, Ivelisse's family in Puerto Rico and uh, those in the Dominican Republic and Bermuda that were hit by the first hurricane and then those um, in Cuba and in Florida that were hit so hard by Hurricane Ian. And it's still pouring rain all over so many people. Um, Father, we lift up those who have lost their homes to the flooding and the mud. Uh, we thank you so much for the stories of care and love that son who swam a half a mile to help his mother and all of our first responders father we're so thankful for um, our firemen and our uh, ambulance workers and helicopter pilots and and police officers and hospital workers and so many people who are risking their lives to care for others uh, thank you father for that and and uh, I pray that in the coming days you would help us join in the recovery to help support our brothers and sisters Father, we lift up our sister Darlene to you. Um, thank you for your continued care in her life. And we pray for your continued presence as she deals with some things. We lift up her work situation, Father, that they would find um, more RNs and a physical therapist. And for now, that you would help her to deal with the extra workload and the, the trouble of working every other weekend. Father, we know that's hard. We thank you for the praise about Cammie, that her cancer is in remission. Mm. Father, I, it's, it's good to have a praise, and I just want to say thank you for that. Please be with Janine in her breast cancer treatment, and uh, with Marvin Poole and his wife, as they're also in treatment for some significant health concerns. Father, please be with Kay's friend Patty as she is dealing with uh, significant back pain from a chronic injury. Father, we lift up Deborah's family at her passing. Father, we thank you for welcoming her home. We thank you for her testimony and her faith. And Father, we thank you for the assurance that to be absent from our body is to be present with you. So Father, we, we miss her greatly. We will miss her sense of humor. Uh, but we are also thankful for the hope that we will see her again and for the promise that she is no longer in pain. Father, thank you for that. And please be with Deborah and Kelly and Jamie and Sean and everybody else I can't name, Father, their whole family. Please give them comfort in their time of mourning. And um, please give them wisdom as they plan how to <coughs> honor her life and remember the gift that she was to so many. <coughs> Father, we thank you that Janet is recovering from her injury, and we pray for continued recovery there. We lift up Danny and Dylan, Father, and we lift up Gina and Anna, and uh, we're going to throw Edgar and Jane in there, too. Um, Father, please be with their whole family. You know they're dealing with some different things, but we pray for your continued presence and provision and care. Father, we lift up the pantry to you. Um, you know our needs. And um, we speak them to you. Uh, Father, we pray that you would help us to provide as much food as possible in this coming pantry day. And we specifically pray for, for protein. Um, we also, Father, lift up this poultry farm. Um, they have been so generous in, in donating sacrificially to, to our pantry and so many others. And now they're dealing with a very significant problem, having lost their flocks disease. And so, Father, we pray that you would care for the workers at that plant, that they would um, not suffer too bad from this financial setback, and that you would continue to bless them so they could continue to bless the hungry in three different states. Um, thank you, Father, for, for places like that who are willing to sacrificially give mm -hmm. to help so many people. Father, we pray for the upcoming events. Um, we lift up our own revival services in South Jersey coming up at the end of this month. And Father, we think of next month of Thanksgiving, of the, the giant Thanksgiving meal at the mission. 
and everything that needs to happen to make that work and our own attempts at giving out Thanksgiving dinners here, Father. I pray that as much as we're trying to give food, that you would help us to always remember to give love and give hope. Help us to share your good news with everyone we encounter. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, so we are in Ezekiel 38, and um, we just started last, last week when we got through verses 1 through 6, and then we kind of got a lot of big kind of 30,000 foot view conversation about prophecy and Gog and Magog. So I want to go ahead and reread the, the verses, and then we'll just ask real quick if there are any questions about that, and then we'll plow ahead. Okay. All right. Could somebody please read verses 1 through 6 for us? May I? Sure. Chapter Ezekiel 38, verses 1 through 6. And the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshesh and Tubal. Pro tu is it Tubal or Tubal or Tubal? Sure. Something like that. Not tubble. <clears throat> Prophesy against him and say, This is against you, O God. Oh. Sorry. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against you, O God. She friends of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and bring you out with your whole army. Mm. Your horses your horsemen fully armed, and a great horde of war, with large and small shields, all, all of them brandishing their swords. Persia, Cush, C Persia, Cush, and Put will, will be with them, all with shields and helmets. Also, Gomer with all its troops, and Beth Togama mm -hmm. from the far north with all its troops the many nations with you. Thank you. There were a lot of hard words there. You did a great job. Some Bibles, just so you know, um, Cush is Ethiopia and Put is modern day Libya, so your Bibles might say Ethiopia and Libya. My Bible actually has the little thingies for pronunciation. Yeah, that's helpful. That's helpful. So Gog and Magog are kind of, um, first of all, just remember Gog is a name Magog is a place, right? So it's uh, Magog roughly translates to the land of God. Right, Magog is the land of God. So Gog from the land of God, right? So generally I'm just going to be saying Gog, uh, addressing the individual, but you get what we're saying, right? The, the, the topic of Gog and Magog comes up a lot in prophecy discussions because it's a little bit on the mysterious side. All right, so as we're going through this discussion, I'm going to try to be very clear to define what we know and what we think, okay? There are some things we know, some things we think, okay? So even th just as a little bit of a recap, what's one of the big things that stands out about the beginning of this prophecy? We're missing something that we often get in these prophecies. Okay. Right. We don't have a time. Right? It, wasn't, it, it won't be in the year of so-and-so. Right? So it does not date when Ezekiel received this vision, and it does not date when this vision will take place specifically. Okay? So that's one of the first uncomfortable places for us. Because we'd like to know, well, it, was this past or future for Ezekiel? Is it past or future for us? And it's a little harder to figure that out when we're not explicitly given that info. Okay? Um, we know that Gog is from the far north, um, but we don't know exactly where Magog is. Okay? Um, we've got some familiar images that are brought back up, but used in slightly different ways. Um, God putting the hook in the mouth of an evil leader. That's something we've encountered a couple times before. In the past, what happened when God put the hook in the mouth of an evil leader? Right, they were pulled out and destroyed. In this case, when the hook is put in Gog's mouth, 
What does God do? I'll try to enunciate there, but I know it's hard. Does, does God put the hook in Gog's mouth and destroy him? No. Yeah. no. What's he do? He brings him out before his armies. Brings him out to war. Yeah. 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 So, interesting difference there. And we're going to get into this more. 38 is not a super long chapter. There's just a lot of stuff to talk about there. But we'll, we'll try to get through this. My Bible says, just a, a kind of generalization of the chapter 38, the oracles assume the return to Judah has not yet occurred. Right, so we're going to get into that as we get through, but there are some things, some, some details that are given in this vision that do help us place it. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, like you said, there's a reference to Israel being back in the land and having repopulated the land. We know that hadn't happened in Ezekiel's day. Um, there is also, well, hello, Venus. There's also going to be a note later on that this will happen in the distant future. So that's, oh, remember, Anka, remember you're learning about qualitative and quantitative terms? Right? Is distant future qualitative or quantitative? Qualitative, yeah. It's a comparison term. It's not, a, it's not a, in a thousand years. It's in a long time. Well, God speaking through Ezekiel, right? So what is, what is a long time to God? Is that a million years? Is that a week and a half? God doesn't exist in time. Right. So we've got some details, but not all of them. Well, it says, it doesn't say that Ezekiel will say it. Ezekiel is speaking this prophecy, but a lot of times when God is giving Ezekiel a prophecy to say... There are things that get written down, but they don't, they're not necessarily spoken face to face to the person they're for. So like when God gave Ezekiel a word against Tyre, mm -hmm. he said, on this date of this king, God said this thing against Tyre. But God didn't actually send Ezekiel to Tyre to speak it to that king. Mm -hmm. right? So Ezekiel is still in Babylon with his people as he's speaking. Right? Now, there, there are some hints there that are important. Let's talk about cardinal directions just a little bit. When people in Israel are sent off into the wilderness, they're often sent to the east. Do you know what major nations lie to the east of Israel? Europe? Like Italy? Spain, that's that's Egypt. west. Huh? Well, really, it's the Mediterranean Sea. To the east which would be your way. It's Syria and then Egypt. Okay. So that's a place where they came out of, of captivity. So getting sent to the east is a symbol of being sent off into the wilderness, being, you know, being sent away from the promise. The way Israel was set up, because you had the Mediterranean Sea on one side and this wilderness on the other, when foreign armies would come in, They'd often come over, but then they'd have to button hook around, right? So the, ar the invading armies would often come down from the north. That's what Babylon did, okay? So you have these themes of the people being sent east as a sense of exile, like going back to Egypt, which symbolically is slavery for them, right? And then enemies from the north, because geographically, that's where the enemies tended to come in from, right? What or where is Gomer? Um, it said uh, Gomer and all of its armies will also join you along with the armies of Beth Togarma from the distant north and many others. Right, so n another nation to the north. Okay. Yeah, another nation to the north. That's what, my, that's what I found in the note. Um, but I'm just going to say, let's broaden our perspectives just a little bit here, right? Um, there's a phrase that's used in other prophecy, the armies of the nations, right? We're kind of listening to greatest hits. These are people who have not necessarily had prophecy spoken against them yet in Ezekiel, but now we're getting prophecies against a lot of these other countries. And possibly Gog of Magog is meant to represent all these enemy nations that surround Israel. 
Well, it sounds to me like Gomer's a pretty big nation. It says Gomer and all its armies. So it must be pretty good size. It's not listed in my map index. Yeah, it's it's not either. It's it's a people group, not a place, I think. So well, Magog isn't listed either. Yeah. It's not. Magog is not listed on maps. So well, let me jump we'll, we'll make another connection. I think we talked about this a little bit last week, but in Revelation chapter twenty when Satan mobilizes the armies of the world against Jesus, yeah. he mobilizes Gog of Magog. Right. Right? So, when you look at, now, now of course, in Ezekiel's day, they didn't have that prophecy yet. The revelation of John came um, somewhere in the, you know, AD 70-ish range. I'm being real loose there with that date. Okay, real loose. But later, later on in the first century. So this was after. This was one of the one of the latest writings that any of the disciples made. Okay, the Revelation of John is. He was the last disciple to die, and then his writings were put together by followers of his. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the last things. That's one of the most recent additions to the Bible. I should say. But for us, we have that. So one of our tools when we get something we don't understand in the Bible is to look where else it's mentioned in the Bible. So we'll just do a quick recap here of some of our notes from last I week. I that Gog of Magog is going to be living when Revelation happens. Or maybe Gog of Magog is meant to symbolize a group or, an, or a group of enemies rather than a specific person or place. Right? So, there is a person named Gog mentioned in 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 4. He is a Jewish man, a Reubenite. Okay? Mm -hmm. We can be pretty sure that's not who we're talking about. He was not a great king of the north. Okay? So, there's one time the name is used, but that's not what we're talking about. Here, um, he's described as the prince of Meshech who ruled over the land of Magog. But that's just saying Gog who ruled over the land that Gog ruled over. Right? Because um, Magog is the land of God. Um, the other places listed, and I'm quoting here from an article by R.K. Harrison. So this is not my scholarly work. Um, Magog was evidently a territory located far from Palestine whose inhabitants would attack Jerusalem in a final attempt to overthrow God's people. Now he's spoiling a little bit because we haven't read all of that yet. That's a little. That in Revelation, though. Well, it's in Revelation and it's in Ezekiel thirty-eight. Okay. okay. The difference is in what we're reading in Ezekiel thirty-eight. What is the what is the motivating factor that gets Gog to go out to war in Ezekiel thirty-eight? God. God puts the hook in his mouth. In Revelation, Satan stirs up the armies of this world. Yeah, right. But we've seen before where God works through enemies to bring about his prophecy. Mm -hmm. So this is, we're mixing things up just a little bit here, right? Um, they're looking at the same issue from different sides. Um, some people have tried to identify Gog with previous historic rulers. We named some of them last time. But for every scholar who identifies Gog with somebody who already existed, there's another one who says he didn't exist yet. Right. Um, so I'm going to go with the distant future note here and the connection to Revelation and say, I'm just going to put it out there right in the beginning. I don't believe this prophecy has come to pass yet. Mm -hmm. right, I'm going to put my bias out in the beginning. Okay. So we've got Gog from a distant land. Let's read through the rest of this, and then we'll, we'll do our overview at the end here. Um, keep going here. Can somebody read verses 7 to 9? Yeah, I can do it. Get ready. Be prepared. Keep all the armies around you mobilized and take command of them. A long time from now, you will be called into action. In the distant future, you will swoop down on the land of Israel 
which will be enjoying peace after recovering from war and after its people have returned from many lands to the mountains of Israel. You and all your allies, a vast and awesome army, will roll down on them like a storm and cover the land like a cloud. Mm. Right. Said, yeah, you're good. Stop there. So, how does this sound so far? If you just read 7 to 9, what would you be thinking? There will be another war. Yeah, God's stirring up an army for war, right? Yeah. Um, and Israel's already living in peace and, and in their country. Right, so, in the distant future, that's one of our key words, right? Mm -hmm. You will swoop down on the land of Israel, which will be enjoying peace after recovering from war. So, we've got some verb dancing there, but when this thing happens in the distant future, Israel will already be enjoying peace after recovering from war. Okay. What's happening to Israel when Ezekiel is speaking these words? They're in exile. Right. They're just beginning their 70 year exile in Babylon and they haven't even begun to come back and rebuild the land. Right. Um, and I think there's a fair argument that from the Babylonian captivity until today Israel hasn't really had their time of peace. They've kind of gotten passed from one hand to another. It wasn't until very, very recently in the 60s when the, the British Empire relinquished their control over the area that they really had any political sovereignty. And it's still split between at least two, more like four, <coughs> major groups. In the very least, you have the... The, the Jewish Zionists and the Palestinians who are battling politically and not just politically but also fighting. Isn't Israel being bombed right now by like aren't they being bombed on missiles or something like that? Well that's what I'm talking about. So you have the Palestinians so we're going we're gonna to do a really quick history of Israel, okay? Alright, you got Abraham, alright? He has a kid He's got a kid. He has 12 kids. They end up in Egypt. They have lots of kids, but they're slaves. Okay? God takes them out of Egypt, but they're jerks. So they wander for 40 years until that whole generation dies. Everybody who's left, maybe a million, maybe three million, hard to say, they get taken into the Promised Land, led over the, over the, the Jordan River by Joshua. Okay? They establish a land. Yeah, but there's people who live there. Boo. Lots and lots of fighting. Okay? Um, Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hevites, Jebusites, Gibeonites. Lots of people, right? Mm -hmm. There's a land flowing milk and honey, so there's lots of people there. Lots of fighting. They establish their land. They don't yet have a king. Then we go through the period of judges. Mm -hmm. You have people like Gideon and Samson and Deborah and Barak and eventually Samuel who serve as leaders who are brought up from certain tribes to lead the people, but they are not a king that rules over a nation, right? There are still 12 tribes working together as 12 tribes. Samuel anoints Saul to be king. We've got Saul, David, and Solomon, the only three kings who, exit, who ruled over a unified Israel, okay? Saul's son takes over. we got lots of fighting. Civil war split up. They exist for about 400 years, three, 400 years as split as north and south, right? Israel, Judah. Assyrians conquer the north. Babylonians conquer the south and everything else, okay? That's where we're at right now. Babylon has just conquered and the people have been carried off. A couple more groups come through and conquer. The Medes come through and the Persians come through. This is where we have the stories of Daniel and Esther, during this time, the people are allowed to come back and resettle Jerusalem. That's where we have Ezra and Nehemiah take place, right? Um, they come back, they rebuild the city wall, they rebuild the temple, they start to resettle the land. They never fully get back the northern lands, okay? So, um, they get passed through a couple different groups of people. Eventually, Alexander the Great comes through the area. 
takes over, then there's a group of four different leaders after him that are all fighting for it. That's when we have the stories about Hanukkah and Judah Maccabeus, Judah the Hammer, okay? Um, during that time, the Samaritans fight with the Seleucids against the Jewish people. So that cements the fighting between the Samaritans and the Jews, okay? Then we skip ahead a little bit more to Jesus' day. Rome is in charge, okay? Rome stays in charge until the Roman Empire collapses. At that point, you've got a few different empires that sweep back and forth through. You have the Ottomans and, and a Muslim empire, and then you have the Crusades. So you just have basically Muslim and Christian groups now fighting back and forth for control of Jerusalem. Okay? Um, again, we're fast forwarding really fast here, but after that is basically when the British Empire takes control of the area. Remember, they were one of the, anyway, they, they were part of the Crusades, right? Robin Hood and, and the king and Richard's and Lionheart and all that. Um, so then for a long time after that, the, the, the United Kingdom or the British Empire had control of the area. And then in the 60s, after, after um, things were getting reestablished after World War II and some of the colonial powers were starting to roll back their control, the land was given back. It was renamed Israel. It, had, it was being called Palestine. Mm. It retakes the name Israel. And then you have this huge influx of Jewish people from around the world who are often known as Zionists, people who want to rebuild a Jewish state, rebuild the temple, reestablish Israel as a Jewish nation. But once again, just like the first time they got there, there's a lot of people there. So that's what a lot of the wars have been about in the past you know, 80 years have been the, the Jewish leaders in Israel trying to reclaim land or take land from the Palestinians who are living there. Some of those people got pushed into areas like Jordan and Lebanon, um, and then you've got other neighbors joining the fight, but have you noticed this theme through all these years? They're not, not at peace, no. and they're not sovereign. Right. So even though Israel is a sovereign nation today in, in our political sense, it is, not a, it is not a Jewish nation, right? It is still at war and split between different faiths. Mm -hmm. so, so the prophecy the, hasn't come to fruition yet. Yeah. That's how I interpret it, and that's why I say that, right? That I don't think this has come to pass yet because I don't think we've had that peace. Right. So, sorry, that was like a quick Western Civ crash course. Well, yeah, I'm going to have to go on YouTube and listen to that again. Yeah. <laughs> I probably said some things wrong, but we can talk through it in, in a little more detail later. But it's all in here. Yeah, I mean, if you read Pretty much. if you read Daniel's dream about the statue, yeah. that gives you the overview, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You know, the gold, the silver, the iron, the iron mixed with clay. Yeah. That gives you the basic overview, and that carries you into modern days, really. Yeah. But again, the one thing that's lacking is So peace. what's going to happen to what's, where the temple should be? Well, this is where we start mixing some of our Ezekiel prophecy with some of our other prophecies, right? In the Daniel dream, where Daniel dreams of the statue, you have the iron, which is the Roman Empire, and in the very bottom of the statue is iron mixed with clay, which is a, a newly realized world empire. And then that is destroyed by Jesus. And it's an image of like a, a comet or a meteorite smashing into it mm -hmm. and then creating the mountain of the Lord. Which that's not usually what happens when things from space slam into things, right? Yeah. But that's, that's what this is, right? It's a destruction that is created. By destroying the, the current world order, it makes way for something new. In the book of Revelation, we see that there's going to be um, an antichrist that rises up, someone who claims to be Jesus, um, a, a person who is a religious leader. And during those days, false prophets will fight against true prophets. We'll have the two prophets in Israel that are killed. And eventually, you get this evil anti-trinity that comes up with the antichrist and the dragon and the beast kind of standing in the roles of God, the Son, and the Spirit. They will attempt to overthrow Jesus. Satan will be defeated and bound.
for a thousand years, the millennia of peace. He will be released from the cage and ultimately defeated in a final battle, which is the plains of Megiddo. All the armies come together, Gog and Magog, right? And it's what happens there is the, the Antichrist stirs all the nations of the world against the Lamb. So at that point in the story, you don't, it's not Israel and the world. It's those who've taken the mark of the Lamb and those who've taken the mark of the beast. Yep. Okay? Yep. Those who've taken the mark of the Lamb are mostly dead. They've mostly been martyred. Okay? Yep. And those who have taken the mark of the beast, a river dries up. They come in from the north down into Israel to the, to the plain of Megiddo, which is a real place right outside of Jerusalem. And they, they rise up against Jesus. Jesus is there. And then God rains fire and destroys all the enemies of the Lord. Right? And then that is the end to, to peace. Immediately after that battle is when we have the new, the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem coming down out of the sky. And basically the reinstatement of Eden as our eternal paradise. Mm -hmm. yeah. Make sense? Oh, I know um, we're, we're painting in real broad strokes here, right? But this is, this is how we're trying to fit these prophecies together. And it is a little tricky. And if you, if you only study one of them, it's really hard to get the nuance here. But when you read Daniel, when you read Ezekiel, when you read Revelation, when you throw in some Isaiah, in the, you know, it, it helps you to understand, right? Because um, one of the things we talked about in, and we're clearly not going to finish this chapter tonight. One of the things we talked about when the men's group studied the book of Revelation is that these different people, people like Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and John, they all get peaks at the throne room of heaven. And, but they don't all see the same thing. John gets the, the longest and most detailed vision. And so when you look at John's visions of the throne room of heaven, you can see all the pieces that the other people saw. Right. They just didn't get to see as much as what John got to see. So, you know, the... That's because Jesus wasn't in bodily form in the Old Testament. Some of those things had not happened yet, right? right? The lamb had not died and risen right. again. So you couldn't see the lamb, right? So that's why I'm saying that you have to put the different prophecies together to start to get a picture. You can't just read Revelation. Or you can't just read Ezekiel. Which means we'll have to do Daniel next, right? <laughs> I'm up for whatever. I mean, we're on, we're on a Babylonian theme. Yeah. We could do our Babylonian super tour. We could do Ezekiel, then we could do Daniel, then we could do it Ezra and Nehemiah. There you go. I'm up for it. So based on everything that you've said, everything as we know it began with Eden. And it's going to circle around and come back to you. Yes, that's my understanding. That God... So it started with Eden and it's going to end with Eden. God created a perfect world. Mm -hmm. and that we God brought world. sin into that perfect world and broke it. And the whole Bible is God working to restore it. Okay. Through the sacrifice and blood of Jesus. Yep. That the blood of Jesus is what allows that restoration to take place. But in the meantime... Jesus wishes that none would perish. Mm -hmm. And so every human being is going to get the chance to choose which side. To choose which side. Have any of you guys watched The Chosen? There's one little scene where they, they do the scene where Jesus talks to Nicodemus at night. Um, it's, and it's pretty close to scripture. They add a couple little extra things in the conversation just to make it a conversation. But the next morning, or a couple of mornings later, when Jesus and the disciples leave town, Nicodemus almost joins them, but he doesn't. He leaves a bag of gold for them to find, and he hides around a corner. So the camera is set so that you can see Nicodemus and see Jesus and the disciples, and Nicodemus is weeping because he's like torn. I want to go, but I got to stay. I'm a Pharisee, but look what Jesus did. And... Jesus says, you were so close. Okay. Now later on, Nicodemus does publicly side with Jesus when he helps take Jesus down from the cross and bury him. So we're not completely knocking Nicodemus here. Was but Nicodemus one of the twelve disciples or not? No, he was a Pharisee. But it's this idea that Jesus wants everyone to have the chance. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
So that's what I think this middle part is. Right? It's, it's God saying, all right, we messed it up, but we got to give everybody a chance to accept the blood of Christ. And that's going to take time because we all haven't been born yet. And God's word hasn't reached every nation yet. And even at the end, when the sky is falling, people will be cursing. Well, they will acknowledge God, but yeah. deny Christ as Messiah. Right. Which is the saddest combination. I, I know. Think. Yeah. So, man, that means we only got through four new verses tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but we did get through the entire history of Israel. Yeah. Yay. So. We had a good history list. Yes. But yeah, that's how I understand the Bible, right? That God made it perfect, we broke it, and the new covenant in the blood of Christ is God's way to, to let us be made right with him again, a way for us to get back into heaven. Because God knew we were going to break can't. it. <laughs> yeah, sorry. You, the humans can't. Right. We, All those rules and regs, you know. Right. And we just covered this in Ezekiel, right, that... The, leader, the human leaders led the people astray, right? But God is sending a good shepherd. God will lead the people. He will send his good shepherd. Right? And so Jesus, and he, this gets talked about in the book of Hebrews, Jesus represents what Adam could have been. Right. You have the old Adam that brought sin into the world, and then the new Adam that brings salvation to the world. So Jesus, as a, as a man who does not sin, and follows God with his whole heart represents the potential humanity has always had. But we, we didn't choose it. We choose sin because of our sin nature, right? So Jesus represents, like, the re relationship Jesus has with God is what we are all supposed to have, right? And that's what Jesus prays for in John 17, that we would have the same unity that he has with God, that it would all be the same. And Revelation is... Jesus opening the door for that to happen. But he's not going to force that on every person. Ultimately, people will have the ability to choose the mark of the beast, will have the ability to reject Christ. And un again, unfortunately, uh, people like to try to read the Bible in a way that says there's no hell or that no one, but that's just not, that's not what the Bible says. There are going to be people who choose the mark of the beast. And there are going to be people who understand Christ, Antichrist, and still choose Antichrist. Um, and that, that breaks my heart. I think it breaks God's heart, too. How many times have people said, and I probably may have said it years ago, uh, hell is going to be one big party. No, it's not. Well, people like to say that, but, yeah, you no, know, it's not. the phrase most commonly in my head associated with it is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Right? Uh -huh. and utter black darkness. The outer, outer darkness, darkness, yeah. So yep. Jesus said, yeah. So that's a, the idea of eternal conscious torment in hell. That's another thing that we got to talk about. Because no a lot of our ideas God. about that are... There's no love. There's no knowledge of God whatsoever. Well, a lot of our ideas about hell are coming from... Um, basically pop culture, old pop culture, but pop culture, things like Dante's Inferno or Milton's Paradise Lost. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll, we'll, we can get into that more in another day. Um, right now it's 726, so we are planning on joining the Millville Church at 730 to pray for revival. Um, I'm just giving a heads up to our friends online. You should have audio, but you may not have video of this. So, um, I may, yeah, so, so you might not have video of what we're seeing, you'll still see the room, but you'll be able to hear the people from the other church talking to us, okay? Um, I guess we could tip the camera up so they can see the TV, Yeah, I thought. but it's going to be really small. Are you going to share your screen or no? I'm not sure if that's going to work or not. Oh, okay. Yeah, All right, so I'm to going to pull up um, Zoom right now. Should we move the camera? Not yet. We'll see how it works. Um, give me one second. Oh, come on. I'm trying to get it. I'm trying to get it. Of course, it signed me out of my document. That's great. <laughs> Nobody saw me type in my password. 
<laughs> no, you're not sharing your screen yet. Because I got I was like, you know what? I'll copy the Zoom meeting and passcode into a document so that it's really easy to get. And then somehow Google Docs signed me out of the document. All right, join with video. Can you hear us? Yes, thank you, Pastor Paul. Uh, I don't know if you can see us, but uh, I'm going to mute us so you don't get too much background noise. Hey, no, so while you're there, and since you're already sharing with us, um, Millville Church is thrilled to have you be a part of what we're doing. Um, and I, can you see our screen that's being shared? Yes. yes. Okay. So we're, we're following through on our theme, and I wonder if you, Pastor, would share with us what you expect uh, from revival, or what you're expecting from God these days, and then lead us in a prayer of expectation. Would you mind doing that? I don't mind at all. Okay, so just for any of you who might not know, Pastor Paul is a son of Diane, John and Diane Brown, and Michelle's brother, and uh, has been a part of this church, and on staff here. Now he's pastoring the Pensacola Church. And, and the folks at Pensacola Church, we are delighted that you're with us. Thank you so much for giving up time to be with us. So go ahead, Pastor Paul. Um, just to share a moment, we're studying Ezekiel right now. And um, about two weeks ago, we read Ezekiel 37, the Valley of Dry Bones. And that has been a theme for us this season, that where we don't see possibilities, God sees life. Um, part of our testimony this summer has been a new outreach to our neighbors, to the kids in our neighborhood. We had been working for a couple of years to get something going, and we just kept falling flat on our faces. And so we spent a year in prayer. We started last September. And this summer, a little boy in our neighborhood broke a window. And that broken window opened the door to a connection with all the kids in our neighborhood. And now Jill and Diane and Annika and a few other people are leading a group of kids on Sunday nights. Um, we have bikes laying in our church yard and kids from the neighborhood walking to church. We're having a family meal together after they study the Bible. And it has been God bringing new life. And our prayer is that that would be the first fruit of what God wants to do in all of our churches here. That he would lead us through his spirit. So please join me in prayer. Father God, I thank you that we can join together with our brothers and sisters all over South Jersey. Father, I thank you for the invitation you have given us to be called your children. Thank you for the love that you offer us, for the new life that you offer us. Father, thank you for making us holy, for making us yours. 
I pray, Father, that these revival services coming up would not just be the usual. Father, we've had a lot of the usual, and it, it doesn't work. <laughs> Father, I pray that we would not seek to have you bless the things that we want, but that you would show us where you are working and allow us to join you. Father, help us to see the work of your spirit in the world and help us to join in. Father, we know that there is no place in this world where you are not. We know that there is no person in this world that is away from you. And so, Father, we don't ask to bring you places because you're there. And we don't ask to do things for you because you're infinite and you don't really need us. But, Father, please allow us to join in your work. Father, we are so blessed to know your love, to have your peace and know your hope. And Father, I pray that you would help us to share that. Help us not to sit in our churches and drink milk, but help us to eat meat and grow strong and be your servants in the world. Father, I pray that we would not be like the salt that grows salty or the lamp that is hidden. Help us to shine brightly with your love, Father. Help us to not only be your disciples, but to make disciples. And help us to share your good news with the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. As you were talking about Ezekiel, and as Walt was praying, I was thinking about the last word of Ezekiel. And the name of the place is Yahweh Shema. God is here. And uh, God is in the midst of his people. Thank you for that prayer. It was powerful. Um, to, to, to Pastor Ru uh, Ruth or Pastor Chris Jonas. to make that 
us to. So that we come expecting that when we surrender to you, Lord, that you will make a change in our life that will make another change in our life that will make another change in our life. And as we step down the road, all of a sudden we will see a huge overhaul. But it won't be maybe all of us. Maybe it will be a little step by little step in a manageable way that, that feels peaceful and restful and loving. So we thank you for being our tender shepherd. And we surrender all of this to you in Jesus' name.
He wants to come and be refreshed. And I, I hope that that is um, meant. And um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? In, in, in an abundant way, I guess is the word I'm looking for. Um, but we were just in a meeting and talking about the grief and the mourning that so many people have experienced over the last several years. And, um, our church is especially um, and having so many pastoral transitions and turmoil here. That is a prayer that we can some wounds and love on one another and just um, find, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm sorry, I'm terrible with words. That's why I made sure it's everything. I just want everyone to that sense of unity that Christ prayed for among the believers is what I'm looking for, and I'm looking forward to meeting some of my brothers and sisters across the district that we've not yet met. And um, I think it's going to be a beautiful time. I'm really just looking forward to coming and seeing what the Lord wants to do. I'm just coming with great and expectations. But um, I'm going to pray now, and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I look forward to meeting each of you. Oh, my God. What a joy it is to come together with these brothers and sisters um, across our zone. <clears throat> Just to breathe in your grace, to exhale praise for who you are, for your love and your mercy and your watch care of the cross. Because of your love and your spirit, Lord, that dwells within us, the unity and the bond of peace that we share with one another, I am excited about sharing it up close to personal and just coming together to see what you are doing. I know that you're doing new things. I know that you are making streams in the desert, and I know that you are mending the broken heart and that you are healing deep wounds and you are saving lost souls. And so, Father, my, my prayer is that you would just infuse us with a fresh touch of your spirit, Lord God, one that when it is expressed out of us, just flashes on people as we walk by, not necessarily because we've said or done anything, but simply because we have spent so much precious time with you, Lord God, that it just oozes out and splashes on every person because we brought your presence their presence. Lord, we're just asking that you would move in a mighty way and that you would delight in us as we delight in you. And I just ask this in the precious, holy name of Jesus, Lord God, knowing that it can be so. I'm praising you in advance for what you're going to bring to us through the speakers and through the worship and just through the presence of other believers who want to come together and worship you in a mighty way. Oh, Lord, we glorify it all. In Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. Thank you so much. Um, I reached out to Pastor Kerry, and we want to be praying for the Seashore Church for having their weekend revival this weekend. And his family's coming in for that. And he said, God is causing me to anticipate miracles these days. Amen. So we're praising God. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and and, and still, we're going to just kind of wind down here. And you're welcome to stick around, or if you need to be doing other things, uh, that's okay too. Uh, but thank you so much. And we are really, really looking forward to being together with all of you to celebrate uh, revival and what God wants to do. And one of the promises that is in that verse is God is making a way for his children to come home. And uh, so as we wind down tonight, um, the embrace part, uh, what is God calling me to embrace? I think one of the things... Okay. Um, for our friends on Facebook, thank you for being... Uh, thank you for being flexible there. Um, I know it was a little bit different to try to do Zoom and a live stream at the same time. So I hope we didn't lose everybody during that time, but hopefully you could hear the prayers. Um, Anka, could you turn the camera for me a little bit? I'll turn it back to this way. Uh, a little bit more. And come up a tiny bit. Thank you. Um, so for anybody who joined in during that last part, we were joining in 
with other South Jersey churches for a prayer for revival. We're hosting revival services at the Bridgeton Nazarene Church, October 29th through November 2nd. And so um, if you've never been a part of a, a zone revival before, we didn't get to do one last year, but one of the important parts of revival is the prayer leading up to that, that time. It's important that we enter into these services prayerfully. So um, we have several different pastors from the area preaching. Uh, Pastor Kerry is going to be bringing us home on the second. And um, you heard Pastor Desiree pray. She's going to be helping lead worship. Pastor Matt is going to be helping lead worship and several people from other churches. So um, we're very much looking forward to gathering together during that time. And uh, thank you for hanging on with us a little bit late so that we could join in that. And we're just going to real quick close in our own word of prayer, okay? Father God, thank you once again for this day. Thank you for a chance to be together and study your word. Father, we're getting into some deep waters here with this prophecy stuff. And I pray that you help us to go slowly and gently and to have our hearts and minds open to the leading of your spirit. Father, I know you're not into fortune telling. You're into making promises. And so help us to look for your promises. Help us to look for your promise of restoration of renewal and for the ultimate promise at the end of this word that the world will know that you are Lord. Father, we pray for that day and we rest in that knowledge ourselves personally. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, we'll go ahead and end our stream. Thank you guys online. We'll say bye to everybody. Uh, yes, Venus, we are going to carpool to Bridgeton if that's what we were talking about. Good night, Venus. Good night, Jane. Good night, Charlene and Hunter, even though you can't hear me. Good night, Trudy. And good night, Cody. And of course, I have the cat. And good night, Kasher. We do watch it, I promise.